I'm pleased to be part of this team. I think this is a very important topic, and it's tricky to figure out. Um, I would be happy to answer clarifying questions during my presentation, but since Paul and Crystal will have additional examples and explanations, um, I think that holding those kinds of questions toward the end or answers for those questions toward the end might be better because you might you might have your questions answered later on. So this is going to be some communication basics about controversy. And the first question would be is, well, what is it that makes a controversy? And I think that anybody would say, well, people have different ideas. They have different opinions. That might be because they have different facts or perceptions based on that, those, their, that, that form their opinions. Um, they may not have the same information. They may not be perceiving the same thing or they may be coming at it from two different perspectives that creates different ideas, or someone may actually have misconceptions. They just have some wrong ideas in their head that creates controversy. Extension agents know how to provide information, and they often know how to correct misconceptions. So just having different opinions isn't necessarily a controversy. But we also have, I think, when it comes to these deep and difficult controversies, is differences in values. And our worldview and the values that we hold actually act as filters so that we see different information, we perceive different ideas, and we remember things differentially. And so because of that, our worldview is actually creating the different facts and perceptions and opinions that we have in our, in our heads. And of course, special interests, advocate groups, and media also help create those different perceptions and opinions. So taken together, we end up with controversy. It's easy to think, oh, well, I'm going to avoid that. <laughs> I don't want to go there. That sounds really difficult. And some extension agents do. They make a practice of avoiding these kinds of issues. But I think that if the topic itself is something that our audiences and clients need to improve the quality of their life and their well-being, either economically or environmentally, and if we have access to some science-based facts and recommendations that will help them, then it really is our job to figure out how to communicate through this controversy and provide information to them. It may also be that we see our job as even more than that. Perhaps we're working with audiences to build trust and community to help people solve problems and negotiate agreement. And so for all those reasons also, I think it's our job to figure out how to communicate through controversy or in the midst of controversy. And the bad news, the good news and the bad news, but pretty much the bad news is that the thing that we're most comfortable doing, providing information, is exactly the thing that might not help. Um, certainly if, if the information is lacking, or if people have different forms of information and are able to say, oh, huh, I didn't know that, then providing information is exactly the right thing to do. But it's often the fact that people are coming to this controversy through these different perceptions and worldviews, like the little cartoon at the bottom. Somebody says it's four and somebody says it's three, and no amount of taking time to count those polls will change their ideas. So more information will not help. And in fact... More information can exacerbate the problem. If we look at the graph on the left, this is what we hope would happen in terms of the, um, here we go, my little pointer, this graph. If people don't know very much and we provide more information, then we would hope that differences of opinion actually converge and come closer together. This is the bounded rationality idea of how the world works. In controversies such as climate change, what we actually see is no matter where people start, they don't have very much information. The more information they get, if we're talking about two different worldviews, the farther apart they grow. And so it's the increase of information that's actually exacerbating the problem around these particular kinds of controversies. So we need to figure out more about worldviews and what's going on in order to figure out how to communicate. So, get rid of that little arrow, there we go. So a couple things are going on with these worldviews. 
Some people say it's because people are feeling a threat. There's a risk to something they value, and they want to protect their interests. That means they're going to glom on to a certain kind of cultural identity or worldview and stick to it because that's what they need to protect. If there's a leader of that movement or a leader of that worldview, then this whole notion is, might be also called cultural cognition, but it's certainly called identity protection. And the, the whole idea about extension and homophily, that people communicate best with people who are like them, it sort of relates. It's similar to this idea. So extension is familiar with how this is a very important part of communication. It's also a very human response, and then it's called confirmation bias. And that is the fact that we just can't see everything, and we don't remember everything. And so in conditions of uncertainty, what we want to do is, is find the information that makes us feel like we know what's going on and what we initially thought might be true really is true. So here's a little cartoon that's exactly that. She says, let's begin this meeting, but be aware that I'm documenting all of your bullying behavior. And he, because he knows what confirmation bias is, says, I'm not even close to being a bully, but now your confirmation bias will make everything I say sound like bullying to you. And she says, can you repeat that part of after you implied I'm a delusional witch? <laughs> and so that's her confirmation bias filtering what he's saying and, and creating a situation where she confirms what she's thinking. Solomon Ash did some of the classic research back in the 50s. He had groups of six people in a room. They could all hear what they were all saying, and they were all supposed to say, which of these three lines is the same length as line X? Now, what the respondent didn't know is that five people in the room were accomplices, and only the one respondent was the participant in the study. So the question is, what does that last person say? When all of the other five people are giving the correct answer and saying, oh, well, line X is the same as line B, then everything was fine. But if all five people said, I think line X is the same as line A, 75% of the time, that one respondent gave an incorrect answer just to go along with what everybody else was saying. Um, and Solomon Ash thought that was really not very good. He said that reasonably intelligent and well-meaning young people, because this was on a university campus, are willing to call white black is a matter of concern. And so this is another part of how important worldview is, how important following the leader is, how important going along with the flow and being part of a group, not causing any, not, not causing waves. That all is part of what's going on, and it's completely a human reaction. So this whole notion creates opposition and conflict, which creates controversy. Some people, according to this worldview philosophy, prize personal initiative, independence, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, they respect authority, they value free market and enterprise systems. Those kinds of people might tend to dismiss or ignore environmental risks because we tend to have legislation that then constrains business activity. So that's a whole picture, a whole worldview, a whole set of values on one side of the fence. Other people might value equality, community, equity, and they might be suspicious of commerce and industry because those things often are associated with inequality. So they would be more likely to prefer le legislation that protects the environment and takes care of those things. I think the important thing is both of these values, both of these perspectives are very valuable. And no matter who holds these worldviews, the stronger their worldview, the more likely it is that that worldview will override the scientific information they hear and be a filter on what they hear. Dan Kahan has done some important work on this, and he divides these different worldviews into four perspectives. Um, the hierarchical one and the individualist tend to go together. The egalitarian and the communitarian, communitarian tend to also go together. So that what he sees, because we tend to have a two-party system that most people are part of, um, it becomes a political issue. 
uh, and you can see that the things that are perceived as a high risk to one group are not the same things as the other group perceives as a risk. And the low risk items are exactly the opposite. We've actually seen this in the recent um, political debates. I believe it was Democratic. President Obama came out and said, we need to make sure some people can't get guns. Guns are the problem. And a Republican candidate turned around and said, no one should to change my ability to get a gun. So they're both following this same logic of understanding who your audience is and what their values are. On the one side, it's gun control that's the hot button issue. On the other side, it's the guns themselves that are the issue. And we can see um, you can put GMOs in both of these categories where you think they fit. Climate change is definitely already on this list. And so this is what the controversies are all about in terms of the world views. So our challenge as extension agents is to first accept the idea that we're in the midst of some controversial topics and where we need to, where it's relevant to our job, we need to understand worldview and how to deal with it. Um, so understanding what those audiences believe and how to navigate through these, these issues and presenting information so it can be heard by different worldviews and doing so in a way that maintains their trust in extension and the quality of our information. So I'm going to just say a couple more about these key things in red. We've already sort of talked about the deciding to engage in the controversy. That's why you're here, right? This is what's going on. But if we want to think about understanding audiences' beliefs, one clue is to find out the information that they use and they get. Sometimes it's finding their websites or finding their books. There's, in terms of climate change, there's a fairly good website called Skeptical Science that provides both perspectives and then the science that has you know, the, the part of each perspective that is supported by science. So it's, I don't think it's a neutral website, but it's a way of understanding more about each perspective. And, and I think that's very helpful for extension agents to do. Um, if we go on to presenting this information that can be heard by both sides, one way to do that is by using frames. Um, I think that our other two speakers are going to show some examples of frames. Something like security and family and health and safety are frames that everybody would agree with. Those are important to everybody. Independence and freedom, environmental quality and equity relate. I mean, I think people would say no would not say those are bad things, but they're going to be more important to some worldviews than others. So figuring out how to provide information so that everybody says, yeah, that's, that's important to me, would be a good way to start. Figuring out what their reality is and the truth of their experiences that has provided them with their opinion is also a good way to start. And providing details that are actually going to benefit them when we tell the forest landowners that trees are going to grow better in the southeast in the next 50 years because of climate change, they're more likely to listen to information about climate change. Politicians provide great examples of using frames because they're trying to make they're trying to appeal to many people all at once. So here, our nation, which is one frame, has obligation and self-interest in facing head-on the serious environmental, economic and national security threats caused by climate change. He's got every frame all in the same sentence. So that's the sort of thing extension agents can do as well. So if we continue on to thinking about this position of trust, we know that many farmers and landowners value extension because they trust extension. We don't want to harm that position of being a trusted source of information. Andrew Hoffman suggests that, at least in terms of climate change, there's four different sources of mistrust. The message, people don't want to hear that information. The messenger, who's providing that information. The science behind it, or the solution that it speaks to. And so thinking about these four sources of mistrust might give us some ideas about how to spin those into foundations of trust. That this is information that can help you solve a problem. That extension, of course, cares about you, your community, your well-being, your financial situation, and that's why we're providing you this information. 
being sure that as extension agents, we're teaming up with researchers that have the science and providing several of them so that when the science is presented, it's locally applicable and the information is presented in such a way that helps people understand, okay, I understand where this came from and how it was used and why the alternate solution is not really relevant in this case. And then providing some solutions or suggesting that extension help facilitate a process of people working together to create those solutions that will work for them. And that speaks to an opportunity to create dialogue and deliberation, and that some extension agents find this to be a solution to controversial issues, creating a space for people to share their concerns and their ideas and to say, I really don't understand this. Tell me more. Or to say, no, I really don't believe that's true because this is what I've seen. Creating that environment in a workshop or a presentation is a great way to help move through these controversies. Now, for some people, that's not their skill. That's not their style. They provide content, period. And so that opens up a possibility of maybe working together and having some teams of people do these kinds of presentations. There are several important resources that might, you might find interesting. This one over here, the Psychology of Climate Change Communication, is about climate change, but it does talk about a lot of the psychology of communication, and you could extract it to other sorts of controversial issues. These two materials are rather similar, and they start off with generic questions that many people ask about climate change and then provide the science behind it. One is from the National Academy of Science, and the other one is National Academy of Science working with the Royal Society from the United Kingdom. And then over here is Andy Hahn. These three are all available on the website. You can download the PDF for free. Over here is Andy Hoffman's small book that's available on Amazon for, I don't know, $8, 10 $12. If you're interested in this trust issue or climate change in particular, that's a great, easy read that I can recommend. 